Well, thanks a lot. It's a great pleasure to be here. I, uh, I've spoken in this hall before. I'm kind of beginning to feel like an engineer a little bit. Um, just as a, to give a little background on me, my, my daughter's actually an uh, engineering graduate student at Georgia Tech. And um, when uh, Julio sent me a uh, thing saying, would, would you like to be uh, appointed as an uh, adjunct professor of engineering, I went, absolutely. I'd love that. That would be the greatest thing in the world. So as soon as I got that, I sent it to my daughter, who's trying to get a PhD and is, God only knows how long that's going to take. And uh, I said, see, I, I, I was a professor before you. And she was like, damn. I did all this math, and you just made it through medical school, and somehow slimed into an engineering degree. So I, I thought I'd go through sort of my journey, which is uh, how do I, how does a surgeon end up uh, doing device development and starting uh, doing startup companies? And I thought I'd talk about four different uh, products, and then at the end of it, maybe talk a little bit about. Um, what you should think about and, and really get back to you as students and say what should you think about when you're selecting what do you want to do? How do you actually innovate in this space? And um, the first product, this shows you some pitfalls of my life. Um, and most of these are going to be built around students, which is to me the really key catalyst of this is the sort of um, ability to take a, a look at something um, without any preconceived notions, which is a student. So you can come to something and say, that doesn't make any sense, but something that obviously makes sense to me. The first thing we did, um, I was a surgeon doing liver cancer. That's what I do. And one of my uh, residents was working in my lab. I had a research laboratory and did uh, tumor immunology. But we'd had this sort of liver model where we were kind of mucking around with these mice and rats. And he, uh, one day I went in the lab and he had a little probe and he was kind of sticking it in the liver. And, I said, what are you doing? And he said, well, I've got this new cool device to kill liver cancers. And I said, well, that's not the way you're going to kill liver cancers because you need you know, gene therapy and this very complex algorithm we had with all these mice. And we had had this uh, IDE through the FDA for this gene. And it was taking us years to get this through the FDA. And he said, well, I think this might work. So uh, it turned out, of course, that all of our FDA things we eventually treated 12 patients, and it cost us, I think, $5 million to treat those 12 patients because we kept having to buy more stuff. And he was able to, with this little wire, figure out how to put microwaves into the liver, which seems like a trivial thing now, but nobody had ever tried it. And um, then, we, then this is my naivety as a, a surgeon. I said, where did you get that? And he says, well, some guy... Some engineering guy gave it to me, and I said, well, that's cool. I said, why don't you, we'll just help him. So we helped him, and um, eventually that company was sold to Covidian, which is a giant biomedical device company. Uh, after we tested and gotten it to the point where we tested in humans, and the guys that founded that company each made mm, $38 million, but we didn't understand IP. So... That's just the way life goes. And, um, <laughs> so I learned a lot that day when I saw the thing where they, they, they actually took us out to dinner and we had this great wine and we were in San Francisco and they were just, and I said, well, how much? And they said, well, we each got, you know, 38 million. I was like, oh. <laughs> they said, well, you know, it's, it's complicated. It's, you know. It's. <laughs> so the next uh, device we invented we, uh, was a way to take out liver tumors, so a way to cut through the liver. It was a really ultra cool device. We worked on it for a long time. We got a lot of money. Uh, we had a SBIR grant. We had an NIH R01 grant, which is a very difficult thing to get in engineering, and we figured out how to do it. And this time we said, ha, we're not so stupid. We're going to not give it to somebody else, and we started a company. And I've now lost, I can't even tell how much money I've lost in this company. Uh, my wife she goes, uh, how's that company doing? And I go, it's doing great. And she goes, how much more money have you poured into it? And I go, uh -huh. 50000 And she went, it's like, she just walks away shaking her head. So that company now has a device that's getting ready to go into the market. But it, uh, it took us five years to do that, to get enough money and enough investors. And I guess my, my point of those two stories is that the naivety was cool because we actually got a device in the market and is now the standard of care for treating liver cancer. Standard of care. There's no, no one's ever built a device better than that one. And we figured it out and we, within a year, had it tested in a patient in the market. The one we're developing ourselves, 
Uh, we're now five years into it. We finally have a device. We're grossly underfunded, and we're out there looking for money constantly. So there's a, a, those are the yin and yang of uh, device development. The other two uh, stories, one of them is uh, Brightsea, which uh, I was, this was our Newvention thing. Mike Morosco really founded Newventions, and I was uh, just one of the guys, one of the surgery guys. And um, the cool thing is these students figured this out themselves. They didn't, all I did was go, you know, fixing hernias with wire in athletes seems like a really bad idea. Maybe you should do something else. And they said, well, we've got this cool idea that they've now taken off and started a company. Um, a couple of them have unfortunately dropped out of medical school, much to their parents' chagrin, and are living in some building in Ravenswood and uh, sleeping on the floor. So, not sure that's a good choice, but you know. Um, but that was really driven by students, and it was built, driven by them developing a device that didn't make any obvious sense to, uh, to me, because I was like, well, there's already a device that does that. That doesn't seem like a giant innovation, but it turns out, in the marketplace, it was a giant innovation, and they've been able to raise lots and lots of money. Um, the fourth is another device, and I'm going to make another point with it, is that, that you can um, breast cancer. So I'm a, I'm a cancer surgeon, so I did uh, quite a bit of breast cancer. And there's, uh, the way you treat breast cancer is you cut the tumor out, and then you uh, sew it up, and then you give radiation to the breast for six weeks. So the radiation is kind of miserable, because you've got to travel back and forth. And, and we're living in the middle of Chicago, and if you live here and you're trying to traverse back down in there, it's, it's like your whole life is going back and forth to the hospital. So that seemed like kind of a stupid clinical problem. And um, so we developed a way to deliver energy to the breast cavity using basically the same technology we did before. And it was something I've been thinking about for a long time. And I could never, I never really had time to deal with it. But I um, was sitting around again with a bunch of students one day, and they said, did you have any kind of good ideas that you, I said, well, I've got this one idea, but I don't, I don't really have time to develop it. Do you guys think you could do anything with it? So now they're off and uh, have just incorporated that company and are uh, trying to you know, take off with that. And I'm sure they'll eventually move into a building in Ravenswood and sleep on the floor. And, and I guess my points, and I, I, I told Ed I wouldn't talk too long, are that the, the key to all those innovations was a, a look from outside. Was, was you guys, students, looking at it from outside. And the other key is me. You've got to find me, someone like me, that can look at a clinical problem and say, and this is just purely medical device development, and say, that's a problem and that's not a problem. So if you have those two ingredients, you're sort of set, because you guys know how to do stuff, and you know how to find people to do stuff, and I know what the problems are. And you just have to make that connection, which is what Julio was talking about. I love coming up here. I like Evanston, it's fun, but it's miserable drive, you know, the usual thing. Um, but there's a lot of people like me. The, the trick to me is that I can look at something and figure out what works and what doesn't, mostly because I've developed that stupid device that the other company commercialized so that I learned a lot from that. And, and once you have those two things, then you have to figure out if whatever your invention is has value. And that, to me, is the, is the giant step that people get trapped in. They uh, have this great idea, they have a prototype, they're almost there, and um, then they have to raise money. And that's such a gigantic hurdle. And one of the things that uh, Northwestern has is uh, the ability to sort of bridge that a little bit. Not completely, but they have access to people, um, they have access to money, they have access to space. And one of the real and Julio talked a little bit about Stanford and MIT. I, I actually like this environment. I kind of like it better here. I was in Wisconsin before this, which has kind of the same setup, uh, engineering school, medical school, law school, business school, all great. Um, I kind of like that environment where everything's not set for you and uh, where you can go in and find uh, Invo. Miriam's here, great Invo person, and go, listen, I got this idea. What do you think? And instead of them going, well, you know, we've got Google, uh, we don't really care about your crummy little idea. They go, well, that's kind of interesting idea. Why don't we work on it? And the sy system here is not is a little bit uh, dis not disruptive, but it's just not perfectly together. But and it takes drive to get through it. But that's what you guys have. I mean, you're kind of the people that'll drive this. So, um, so I, I guess that's all I wanted to say. I wanted to not go over my time and, and leave a bunch of time for questions, but. 
Um, I think you're the engine to this. And if, if you think about yourself as that, if you say, I'm the guy that can drive this, all you got to do is find the right idea. And unfortunately, you can't figure out an idea. If you put a bunch of engineers in a room and say, think up a great clinical device, they'll, it's not going to work. But if you put a bunch of surgeons in a room and say, think up a great surgical device, they'll think up 100 surgical devices, but they'll have no idea how to do them. They'll just sit around all day and try to impress each other. Um, no offense to surgeons. Luckily, there's no surgeons here except me, I guess. Um, but anyway, I thought I would just kind of throw it open to you guys for questions. That's my sort of journey through. I, I could make this much more complicated and talk about financing and stuff. And uh, we could talk about Brightseed, which is uh, there's the guy that dropped out of medical school standing in the back. <laughs> Thanks. So let's start with me. Uh, I grew up with a dad who was, and still is, although he turned 80 this month, uh, a tireless inventor. Everything from uh, decorative covers for light switches on the wall to a new type of golf putter, uh, a garden sprayer, to uh, some much more sophisticated things, these very, very fancy uh, nozzles for super critical gas chromatographs and uh, high pressure Raman cells. And that apple didn't fall that far from the tree. Um, I inherited from him this sort of desire to always be creating stuff. In high school, my big thing was plastic coated ice cubes, you know, so they would cool your drink and not dilute your drink. Um, <clears throat> so you can imagine that when I got this in my fortune cookie, <laughs> I, pres <laughs> I presumed it was more than just, you know, a coincidence. Um, so I want to talk a bit about some of my wacky inventions. Um, and as Julio said, all of my wacky inventions have been collaborative with Michael Peshkin. And those of you who were here two weeks ago know that before he was inventing with me, Michael uh, actually had founded another company, which uh, went on to be sold recently for $1.69 billion. And you won't hear any numbers like that in my talk. So um, the companies we started were uh, Cobotics. Um, and I'll tell you more about all these. Cobotics first, and a little bit of time frame. This was sort of late 90s, 97 to about 2002, followed by Kenya Design, uh, 2002, really up until the present, although we did sell it two years ago, but it continues to operate. Um, and then most recently, uh, Tangible Haptics. So let me tell you a little bit about all of these. Um, <clears throat> Cobotics was all about um, assisting the human worker in a, in a factory. So someone who's putting a part in a car, for instance. And you want to make that man a superman, right? You want to make them very strong and able to move things around very quickly. Uh, so it was really a set of modules that enabled us to do this, which maybe doesn't seem all that fancy, but this is really the first time that we were bringing people and robotic devices sort of right together. Um, and, uh, and, and so that was a big set of challenges. This is a picture of a guy in, a, I think, a Toyota assembly plant taking a big, heavy transaxle and moving it around. And um, um, is Dan Brown here? Oh, too bad, because I wanted Dan to see this, that, that um, one of the things we noticed is that you could see long distances in these plants if you were looking kind of up a little bit. Um, and so it really made a difference to make things visible and, and have your logo there. So, uh, so this, this sort of neon green was sort of our attempt to make, make things very, very visible and get people familiar with our stuff. Uh, it, you know, orange or, or yellow would have been better, but they had been taken. So anyway, we're very proud of that. Um, uh, this is a, a, a video of... Um, of a young boy moving around about 600 pounds of stuff. Um, and um, just for some time context, he's now a, a sophomore in college studying engineering. But, but here's that same device being used to put a, uh, an instrument panel, or what's called a cockpit, a very big, heavy component into a, a Cadillac um, uh, in an assembly environment. So that's what we were up to. Um, as I said, this company started around 97. We kind of struggled along with very little money. Uh, some SBIR, a couple of uh, uh, projects from the auto companies, uh, until, um, well, until I uh, decided I was going to, <laughs> to take a leave from the university, take my sabbatical, um, and, uh, and spend a year. In fact, I took the two summers on either end and took about 15 months to, to run this thing. Um, uh, I won't go into this in depth, but bad idea. Um, uh, <laughs> but, but I had three goals. Uh, they were to raise money, uh, to find a CEO, and to get a product out. 
And to my credit, we succeeded in the first two. Um, uh, the year was 2000. Uh, and for those who might remember, this was, this was still the height of the, the sort of dot-com bubble. And it was actually pretty easy to find money, probably easier than it should have been. Uh, the bubble burst in 2001. And in so 2002, the venture capitalists sold the company. Um, <laughs> Uh, and they took a bit of a haircut in doing it. So the company was sold to the Stanley Works, which is now part of Stanley Black and & Decker, and, and it's operated to this day. Um, <clears throat> so that was, that was our first experience. And, and I have to say that um, at the time, I didn't really appreciate one of the really important things about an entrepreneurial experience, which is the team that you work with. So I searched through my files, and I could not find a picture of that team, which bums me out. But, but we learned that lesson. And so here's a picture of the next team. Uh, Kenny Design. Actually, it's a, not exactly the team. Um, this picture was taken um, in the IDEO product development offices, which used to be here in Evanston. And the, the two ladies in the middle um, are uh, IDEO employees. Uh, but you see Michael and myself, um, Michael looking quite youthful. And, and these two guys had been part of the Cobotics team. So, um, and frankly, this guy here was part of the Mako team in Michael's first company. It's Julio Santos. And, um, so we were pretty thrilled that um, you know, they actually chose to re-up and do one, another one with us. This is Dave Brown. Uh, Dave, until a couple years ago, was on our faculty in physical therapy. And he was really the visionary um, behind this company. Um, and standing behind him is Ela Lewis, who's a physical therapist who worked with them. And in this video, you'll see Ela um, using the first device that our, our company developed, which we called the Kinney Assist. The basic idea, and this was Dave's vision, was to enable the physical therapist through the use of robotics. And so, so this gentleman is a stroke survivor. And Ela is challenging him with some pretty fancy dance moves here that she never would have, in a way, she never would have been able to do had it not been for that robot that was there ensuring that he wasn't going to fall, keeping him safe, but also keeping very much out of his way, um, letting him move as naturally as possible. So that was the, the technology. But with this, this company, we never really, I think, seriously thought that that was going to be the product and this was going to be a product company. We would grow and we'd sell these things. Um, so we quickly kind of morphed into more of an engineering services uh, type company. Um, this is Eric Fallring, who is one of our former PhD students who joined the company and is still with it. And, and, and that's a very advanced prosthetic hand that he played a very big role in developing. And so this is a DARPA funded project. So our company really became a company that did stuff like this. Um, we were kind of an advanced engineering services uh, firm. Uh, so a very different model. Uh, this company never took a dime of investment dollars. The stress level is so much lower. Um, uh, but you don't grow very fast either. Um, uh, actually, we were pretty surprised when someone finally came to us and said, hey, we want to buy your company. Um, and they had to kind of convince us that it was a good idea. But we eventually decided it was. Um, and that, again, happened a couple of years back. I uh, throw this picture in here because I know our dean likes magazine covers. Um, but but that, that hand actually made it onto a magazine cover. So it was very cool. Um, so um, a couple years back, um, we had some new technology in our lab that we wanted to commercialize. And so we started this company, Tangible Haptics. And now we really knew to take pictures of the team. This picture was taken um, in March of this year when we finally um, raised some, some money. Because this is, yet again, a company where we plan to, we plan to hit it big. Um, and I won't talk in great depth about um, what we're doing. But, uh, but anyway, this is the initial team. Uh, we're a couple more people than this now. And, and well, broadly speaking, what we're doing is we're trying to uh, develop technologies that will let you feel and experience through the sense of touch the things uh, that are on the screens that you interact with. So that's a, so that's a, a story that's most of which is yet to be told. But, uh, but we're pretty excited about it. Um, so I want to share with you now um, just sort of four lessons that I've learned through this. Um, and the first really leverages off a discussion that was had uh, uh, two weeks ago, which was the to MBA or not MBA question. <laughs> that is, if you're a tech startup, do you want that MBA you know, on your team or not? Um, and, and I think Greg, uh, you know, Greg was very proud to profess that Quest Tech uh, was an MBA-free zone. Um, and so I wanted to add my own two cents on this, um, which is if, they're, if they look like that, you, you just don't want them <laughs> right, on your team. So, um, um, but at the same time, um, uh, Bill White actually asked me, sort of gave me a, a theme here, which is broadening your horizons. And so here's another fortune cookie. 
um, you will do well to expand your horizons. And frankly, I think one of the joys of being involved in a startup is that you come face to face with the world and all of its complexity, all of its nastiness. Um, you know, technology, as, it, as we see it in our labs, really is often kind of in an ivory tower, if you will. And to deal with that, to sort of, to sort of match the technology up to the, to the resources that are available, to the markets that are available, et cetera, takes a wide variety of skills. It takes a wide variety of uh, experiences to be brought to bear. Um, and so uh, part of the joy for me has been being part of teams that are more diverse than the typical sort of team that I'm a part of here in the university environment. So, and that includes MBAs. Now, I've thought about this a bit. Someday, maybe, I'll be a venture capitalist and teams, you know, teams will come to me. And so if a little tech startup comes to me and it's clear that some MBA is the guy who's calling the shots, then I'm gonna be pretty suspicious. On the other hand, if it's clear that a guy like me is calling the shots, I'm gonna be much more suspicious, right? Um, I, I think that the, the point I'm trying to make is that, <clears throat> that to make good decisions requires a broad base, uh, a broad set of you know, context and experiences coming together. Um, and so I encourage you, as you go off and do your startups, to, to think about that and think about bringing in the right sort of people and building the right sort of teams. Um, but building that, that sort of robust team is, I think, one of the joys of, um, of being involved in the startup. And so the, the, I think about all the sorts of people that I've been able to interact with over the years, from you know, salespeople to um, uh, you know, accountants and lawyers. And, and, and to really get to know and work with closely in a professional context, I, I, I never expected that to be part of the joy, but, but it is. Um, next lesson. Uh, I'll get, get to this in a moment. I have to tell you a story. Um, so when Michael and I started uh, Cobotics, it was actually called Collaborative Motion Control, and we started it with one other person who uh, was a former student. He had been a master's student of ours. And in the early going, we had a little bit of funding from Ford, and it was enough for him to work full time, and we were still doing our professorial duties. And so he was going out into to Detroit and getting into plants, and he was starting to see things. Um, he was starting to see things about the way people worked uh, that gave him pause, made him think differently about what we were trying to accomplish. Um, and, and I wasn't seeing all this. Um, and so our perspectives began to diverge a little bit. He came into my office one day and said, you know, I, I think we're trying to build a Cadillac and all they want is a Yugo. And I don't know if anyone remembers the Yugo, okay? Late 80s, early 90s, imported from Yugoslavia. You could buy one for under $4,000. You got what your money gave you. <laughs> it, it, was, it was crap. I mean, <laughs> it was a terrible car. And for him to come and say, they want you good. I mean, this was my technology. This came out of my lab. This was my passion. I was devastated. I was devastated. I said, I want no part of you guys. Um, and so the, I'm not going to sort of, the, the, there's, the moral isn't that he was right and I was wrong, or I was right and he was wrong. <clears throat> the moral is that, <laughs> I guess we were both wrong. It's really important to get out there and understand the context of use of the technology. It's really important to do that. Now, he was doing that, um, but he didn't necessarily have that sort of depth of experience and understanding of what the technology could do that Michael and I did. Uh, and to our discredit at the time, we weren't out there so much. Eventually, we kind of got the idea, and we started getting, getting out there in the world and understanding how people would make use of the technology. And it, in fact, changed our conception of sort of what the right technical solutions were greatly. Um, so we didn't end up building Yugos um, or Cadillacs, um, but building things that, um, that sort of met the need. Um, and so, so that's part of the lesson, but there's really kind of a, a part two to lesson two, which is that this had a pretty big influence on my outlook on life um, and what I thought was important for an engineer to understand. And some of you may know that around this same time, around late 90s, early 2000s, I was pretty involved back here not in this building because it didn't exist, but back here at Tech um, with something that's now called DTC. Um, so it was called Engineering Design and Communication, the freshman program. Um, and then from there, a variety of other things. Now with, with that freshman program, at the time I was working closely with Greg Olson, who spoke a couple of weeks ago, and also with Dave Kelso, and Dave is probably one of the most successful entrepreneurs that is a member of this, uh, this engineering school. 
And so they had these perspectives, and I was getting this perspective out there in the world that, hey, you've really got to understand the context and bring that in and, and find the right meshing of that with the technology. And so that had a great deal to do with the way that we shaped the development of, of that freshman course, which Bruce Sankerman has done such a great job of taking over and running with, and then subsequent things leading up to the Siegel Design Institute. So I'm, I'm proud that, that I learned some things that actually have informed my teaching. And so for those of you who are faculty thinking about entrepreneurship, I think this is another one of the great joys of doing it. Lesson three is pretty simple, and it's kind of obvious, and that is it is a roller coaster. Um, the academic life is lovely, in part because it's not such a roller coaster. You get a paper accepted, you get a paper rejected, you know, life goes on. Um, when you're in the startup situation, you're typically working with you know, finite dollars and a finite time frame, and there are moments that are defining moments, you know, when you've got to show your stuff and put up or shut up. And I remember another little story. I remember a time at Coho Hall in Detroit when, uh, for Cobotics when our director of sales paid off the security guys so that we could get in the night before the trade show opened to try to make our our device work because it wasn't working. It was on the floor and, and so we spent all night uh, in there, you know, programming and, and trying to avoid security personnel. Um, that was an adventure. It was frightening. It was scary. But that's the sort of thing that tends to happen in a startup environment. And there's a lot of stories like that. Um, so that's one reason that things are, it's a roller coaster. I mean, emotionally there's a lot of highs and lows. But there's another reason I think that it's a bit of a roller coaster and that is I have found that when you're doing a startup, you talk to a lot of people. You know, investors and advisors and, and customers, and they all have opinions. And, and a lot of the time the opinion is that what you're doing is crap. Um, and and if, you, if on the one hand, if you take every opinion and you just internalize it, then you're going to really be on an emotional roller coaster ride for sure. On the other hand, if you just ignore every opinion, you're, you're not going to be learning. Um, so it's really important to have this sort of very tempered approach where you're sort of integrating things you already know with things that you're learning um, and trying to come up with a, a, a more and more uh, a better, better rounded worldview. Um, but at the same time, it's really important that you as the entrepreneur um, are, are the stalwart, right? Because you, there will be plenty of days when things aren't working or when you're being told, and that your idea is terrible, and, and you know, <clears throat> there will be no success unless you are bullheaded and, and you kind of keep on going. So it, it's, it's much more of an emotional roller coaster ride than, than other professional activities I've been part of, um, but you know, that's part of the joy of it as well. And then the final lesson um, is one I, I kind of steal. Uh, many years ago, I was at a professional conference, and there was a dinner speaker who was a, a high level official from NASA. Uh, and the question arose, as it does, um, uh, why spend all this money on NASA? Why do we, why do we put people in space? Um, and of course, there's many reasons, right? You know, there's the, um, the technology that it brings to us, and, and of course, there's lots that can be said about that, or defense, or so forth. But, but he, he was blunt. He said, the, the reason you do it is for adventure. And, and I, I really found that a very refreshing and very honest reply. Um, you know, the hum humankind has always been sort of pressing frontiers, and, and, um, <clears throat> and so uh, what I can tell you, if you're thinking about being an entrepreneur, is that you may or may not make your 38 million, right? You may or may not get your technology out in the world, but you will have an adventure. So those are my thoughts. Thanks. <laughs>